good afternoon, everyone. It's meteorologist Jacob Wyckoff, joined by our executive weather producer, Terry Ellison. You joined us a little earlier uh, to talk about the weather. Now we have a little bit different shifting weather. Gears, yeah, yes. shift, we're talking about space weather. Now. We have an opportunity tonight to see, of course, one of the most rare phenomena in Aurora Borealis. It's always a tricky forecast, yeah. so we figure we'll go right to the expert. Absolutely. Bring, bringing in uh, Sean Dahl, uh, space weather forecaster at NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. Sean, how are you? Great, Jacob and Terry, thanks for uh, having us in here. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's get right to it. A lot of people are gonna be looking to the heavens this evening. What can they expect? What's a, a geomagnetic storm watch that has been issued? Yeah, we issued a, a very rare G4 severe geomagnetic storm watch. We do not issue a G5 watch. We stop it at G4 or greater. Uh, we did that in an anticipation of the arrival of something called a coronal mass ejection, or CME for short, this blast of solar material in the form of strong magnetic fields and charged particles. And when they arrive here at Earth, they can escalate activity up, especially if they're quite strong. We have seen that CME arrival already, the shock, the leading edge of that CME arrived about an hour ago or so already, and we rapidly already spun up and reached that G4 level of activity. That's amazing. So how does this potential compare to maybe some other events that we've had? I, I think back to May of 2024 and October of 2024 uh, here in Massachusetts, we were able to see some really vivid colors. How does this event compare to maybe those that stick in recent memory? Yeah, we don't anticipate this to reach the levels of that May 2024 storm, uh, but this one did arrive pretty strong. This was one CME also, the May storm had like seven CMEs that were back to back to back and all shoveling over Earth uh, after they arrived here. Uh, but this one was a little bit trickier. You mentioned tricky forecasting. It happened kind of toward center disk, but not quite there. So we feel like most of the material is actually going to be behind Earth. But there's enough there that warranted this G4 watch. And we've already verified that. Now, we expect that activity to be possible throughout the evening. But you know what the funny thing about these CMEs, when you get a shock front ahead of these, it's so much faster than the main core of the CME, that driving magnetic energy. We can get into that later on. So throughout the overnight hours, I think people should be paying attention and watching if they want to see the Aurora, because this is the pe best chance that we've had in about two months. So I'm interested in the science of it. Obviously, the sun is about 93 million miles away. Um, we as weather forecasters are, you know, have a hard enough time measuring something that's a few thousand miles away, you know, coming our way. How exactly do you, A, measure the size of the coronal mass ejection, and then B, when it's on its way, obviously there aren't monitoring stations all the way along the way. So when is it that you get a good idea? You said it's just sort of past the threshold. Talk a little bit about how you measure all of that. Yeah, sure. Thanks for pointing that out and asking that question, because this is something people uh, really like them to understand. Yes, space weather forecasting is hard for many of the reasons you just said. We have a line of sight. That's problem number one. We only have one set of observatories, and that's one million miles away from Earth between the sun and the Earth. And it's a direct line of view. We don't have side views. If we had side views, we could do so much better at space weather forecasting. So we have one plane of sky view directly towards the sun. And when we see the CME, we see a propagation of energy going out from the center of the sun in that corona, that outermost layer of the sun. It's a very subjective process, but we actually analyze and measure that CME, kind of its parameters, to determine its, uh, ang its uh, cone width, the width of that CME, its speed, and all this information. We you can find that model result on our web page. Uh, but yes, the speed can vary widely. Now, we were very confident or, or had a fair level of confidence on that there was going to be an Earth impact from this CME and also on the timing of the event. But still, it arrived much earlier than we were anticipating, which is just the tricky nature of such a subjective measurement when you're looking at something directly face on. Does that change the possibility of viewing it tonight if, if maybe the bulk of it isn't arriving in the overnight hours, at least for the continental US? It could, that's what we have yet to decide. Now we know the shock arrived, and coincidentally, by the way, this is something you'd be interested in as well in your viewing audience is that we have also experienced the largest solar radiation storm that we've seen in over 20 years. Wow. We have not seen a solar radiation storm at the S4 level, severe as well, like this since the year 2003. And now based off the measurements we have, it may be back into the 1990s. Wow. That's significant because that can impact aviation and their flights around the polar regions. 
any important communications in high frequency near the polar regions. And then, of course, satellites in space and astronaut health, for example, on the space station, although we've talked to NASA significantly about that event. But we're going back to the moon in a few months. Uh, well, less than a month already, right? This type of activity will be very important for those astronauts. That's why we're the focal point for, for solar radiation storms like this for astronaut health. But as back to the geomagnetic storm, we don't know yet. We're going to continue to monitor the solar wind just as anybody can and should on our spaceweather.gov webpage. You can see the solar wind changes for yourself. But we're still waiting for that magnetic core. The shock goes fast. But then you get that magnetic core. I know I'm talking long here, but let me give one more comparison. Think of like a very strong Arctic cold front. Most of us have meteorology backgrounds such as myself, so we, we speak the language. But think of a strong Arctic cold front blasting in. The temperature may not immediately drop fast sometimes. You get that sudden burst of winds, but it may take a few hours before the temperature starts to drop and plummet. Similar thing with these, when you get a fast shock arrival, you see that solar wind, it escalated to 2 million miles per hour solar wind speed out in space when it passed over our observatory out there a million miles away. And now we're waiting to see just how much of that magnetic core, the centrifuge of that CME as it arrives here at Earth, because that could escalate things yet up again throughout the overnight hours, but we still kind of have to wait and see how the evolution of this CME unfolds. To, um, this is great info, Sean, and thank you for relating it to meteorology. Now Jacob <laughs> and I are kind of like, yeah. ah. Um, talk a little bit about the colors that, you, that you, we sometimes see with these events. I know that there are, obviously there's reds, there's greens. Like, A, is there a way to predict sort of uh, what kind of color we may see? I know it depends upon where in the atmosphere, um, you know, the, the storm is happening. Is there any way to sort of predict that ahead of time? And what causes the different colors? Yeah, it, for us, for aurora forecasting, no, we don't really try to delve into that. We provide that information because we know this is what people want to see, and we're glad they come to our webpage to find out information. But all these colors transpire because of the interactions with the various levels of, of oxygen that are in our outermost layers of our atmosphere, that ionosphere. And when these charged particles funnel into the polar regions, they strike Earth's molecules up there. And depending on the state of energy that they're in, it includes different uh, wavelengths of light. So usually we see green, especially when it comes to oxygen uh, molecules, but nitrogen molecules higher up, they can start to emit kind of this red color. So a lot of people may not even see the aurora, but they can catch it on their digital technology, such as their cell phone or, or digital cameras. Uh, so you, I may not even be seeing it, the eye, the human eye, but yet your camera could very well likely pick it up. So it just depends on how, what kind of molecules are striking up there and, and how energetic everything is and how much is funneling it up there. But yes, the aurora definitely spins up because of the interaction of those charged particles as they rush down Earth's magnetic fields into the polar regions. And the stronger the geomagnetic storm is, the further equator word that oval expands. Hmm. Uh, Sean, when it comes to uh, this type of phenomenon happening when it comes to the solar cycle, there could be some additional opportunities for folks to be able to see this if tonight, and, and this is a highly sort of uncertain forecast, as much as we're certain that a solar storm is hitting us, the colors, the ability to see the colors, are it's still uncertain. If we're not able to see it tonight, where are we on the solar cycle uh, for future viewing opportunities? Yeah, we are in solar maximum still officially, but we're starting to see signs that maybe we're beginning to come down from solar maxima. But that shouldn't turn people off from the fact that we may not see as many storms because historically, some of the strongest storms we've seen have come as we've come down from these. This solar radiation storm is a great example of that. This was very energetic and it's still ongoing as you and I talk. We're still at the S4 storm levels, which itself is unusual. Uh, but the geomagnetic activity, we're going to see more activity at least at the G1 through G3 levels throughout the course of 2026. Uh, whether it's a coronal hole high speed stream, which is what we were originally anticipating until the CME blasted from the sun and changed that forecast entirely. But G4 is still a very good possibility type, but we really have to see because there's a, a very key element to magnetic energy interactions from the solar wind and here at Earth. And that, what is the direction? It's hard enough trying to forecast the CME arrival here at Earth like we've talked about, but we have no way of knowing what the orientation of that magnetic field is. If it's pointed the same direction as Earth, it doesn't connect well, and we don't drive up those forces to get to that G4 or higher level of, energy, of response. But if it's opposite Earth's and it's strong, we connect like two magnets coming together. 
That drives these forces up, and then we can rapidly expand up there into the higher levels of activity, and the chances go up considerably about being able to see the aurora. Well, having said all of that, um, what can you tell our viewers for the, you know, to give them a few tips, like what are their best chances? Obviously one I'm sure would be to view it in the darkest place as possible without artificial light. We can obviously say bundle up because it's going to be real cold, but is there anything else you would suggest uh, a time um, or any sort of, uh, you know, uh, tips for folks that might want to go out and you know, get, try to catch a glimpse tonight? Sure, I would say, uh, you know, when it gets dark, go out early. Go out early as you can, uh, start hoping for it. It may not show up. It just depends on all these magnetic forces and how things are transpiring, whether it's unfavorable or favorable connected here at Earth. But the energy is still there, and that's going to continue on through the night. These CMEs don't go away in an hour or two. They last a while. It's, they're a huge depth of material as they pass over Earth. So I think the overnight hours tonight, uh, the evening hours in particular, is the prime time to be able to have that chance to see the aurora. The um, key is to the north, right? The north up through overhead. That's the area you want to look. So you want to be away from strong city lights or neighbors LED lights that might be lighting up the neighborhood. Uh, as you look to the north, uh, be patient. You know, sometimes we can get sudden bursts of energy as things turn favorable, but then they turn away. So you can have a brief intensification of the aurora. So it's kind of like fishing. You just got to be patient and hope for the best uh, unless it's just strongly connected and we all get to observe a global phenomena like we did back in May of 2024. Sean, before we leave you, how important are events up in the heavens like Aurora Borealis to inspire future generations? Oh, uh, they're amazingly important because we rely upon so much with our technology today. Uh, that can be impacted by these solar radiation storms and geomagnetic storms, all of which we have ongoing today. I mentioned we're going back to the moon. This could be significant for astronauts in space as they're making that flight to the moon. Aviation, we've been talking to the airline entities and air traffic control about these storms as well, because how this can affect their communications, GPS systems, as well as human health if they're up near the polar regions, although that's probably not too much of an issue despite the strength of this storm. Uh, and, you know, th we rely upon so much of these things today. The bulk electrical system, the power grid of North America, we've talked to them extensively since early this morning because they have to take measures to be prepared because this type of energy, not the radiation storm, but the geomagnetic storm, this can drive up intense currents on their high voltage transmission lines and system. And in your area of the country, the upper northeast and midwest to the northwest, they're the most prone for this type of stuff. And if they don't account for those currents of energy, that could overheat high voltage transmission lines that could, uh, transformers that is, that could cause a tense uh, blackout across many states. We don't anticipate that here. It's not at that level, but that's why we talked to them early because that notification makes a difference for them to be prepared. And that's also why we talked to FEMA and have even been sending information to the highest levels of our government about this activity today. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. Sean Dahl, space weather forecaster. Uh, I think even we are learning a few things yeah, along the way here. Yeah, absolutely. If, you think our, if we think our jobs are hard, try forecasting um, some particles zipping our way from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, thanks so much for, for joining us, Sean. You're very welcome. Thanks for having us. Take care. Take care, Sean. What an amazing conversation. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm fascinated. I don't know how you cannot be just fascinated by this kind of stuff going on above our heads. Uh, and I got to think, like he was talking about the Artemis mission coming mm -hmm. up in just a couple of months. The young kids seeing that and saying, I could walk on the moon. That's right. Imagine seeing the Northern Lights and, and the inspiration that people can derive from that too. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously been fascinated by all the th all things going on up above, and I think uh, it just goes to evidence by when we have these conversations or we, we go on social media, there are a lot of folks who are really interested in this stuff, and um, it's just otherworldly. You know? Absolutely. Make sure you stay tuned for the latest forecast. We will be following it here in the WBZ Weather Center. Our space weather prediction, our New England weather prediction, we got it all. whatever the case <laughs> may be, we'll be on top of it.